At this point, I think it's more than obvious as to how much I love Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I could go on for ages about everything I absolutely adore about this game, but that would take much longer than one video. So if I had to choose my favorite part of this masterpiece, it would have to be the characters. I've said it before, and I'll say it again because I mean it. Xenoblade 2 offers some of the most impressive character writing I've ever seen. All of their personalities, interactions, backstories, and development make Xenoblade 2 an extremely memorable game. And what better example of this than the Aegis Girls? I hold Pyra and Mithra in a special place in my heart because of the emotional roller coasters they had me go on throughout Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and Torna, the Golden Country. It's so clear how much thought and effort was put into their stories. So clear, in fact, that I continue to find more and more details every playthrough. Even on my third time experience, experiencing the game. I was constantly coming across so many new things to appreciate them for that I hadn't picked up on already. Pyra and Myth are a character writing excellence. Their personalities provide amazing contrast to each other while still being incredibly likable. They subvert the player's expectations while still feeling realistic, grow and develop in believable ways, and bring tears to your eyes with their role in the plot. They're both such a major part of what makes this story so beautiful. In this character analysis, I hope to do Pyra and Myth are the justice they rightfully deserve. I'll be going over almost every reason I could find as to why they're both so unbelievably great. And yes, I will be going into very heavy spoilers for both Xenoblade 2 and its prequel, so consider yourself warned. Without further ado, I present to you why Pyra and Mithra are amazing characters. I hope you enjoy. In any good story, nature and charisma is of utmost importance when creating a solid character. Not only do personalities allow for characters to diversify themselves from the rest of the cast, but have the player form an emotional attachment which can later be utilized to add more weight to future sequences within the narrative. It's not even a question as to whether or not Pyra and Mithra achieve this. The Aegis Girls are a really unique case because, well, there's two of them. Them switching between each other isn't just a cool combat mechanic, but it's also a really intriguing concept from a writing standpoint. Since they essentially inhabit the same body, it acts as a really nice setup to present parallels. You see, as soon as Mithra is introduced, it doesn't take long for the player to realize that these gals are literally polar opposites. While they share the same core values, suffer from the same main issue, and are both good people, there's little that could make them more different personality-wise. In the words of Sakurai, Pyra's the sweet one. She's gentle, empathetic, bashful, withdrawn, but determined to protect those who she loves. Pyra falls into that role as a dependable, affectionate, and nurturing friend who you can always vent to. She's filled with patience and is forgiving of others' mistakes, although she does struggle to forgive herself, leading her to being very apologetic and doubtful of her own worth. She's easily the most selfless member of the party, but at times finds it difficult to give that same care to herself. On the other hand, we have Mithra, who can be a bit aggressive, reckless, brutally honest, but extremely confident and independent. While Pyra's kindness definitely helps their fellow companions, at times Mithra's lack of fear to express her thoughts can be far more effective in solving issues and getting people to understand where she's coming from. There are so many great scenes throughout the game that showcase how dissimilar they really are. Oh, it's so grand. Sure, because they're trying too hard. You don't have to be like that. Something really clever that this game does is subvert the player's expectations with their designs. Pyra's a fire blade, meaning the primary color used for her model is red. When you associate a character with fire, it's usually expected that they'll be hot-headed, short-tempered, or contentious. That's not Pyra. Whereas Mithra's of the light element, meaning one might think she's innocent, elegant, angelic even. But that's not Mithra. This elemental subversion is such a great way of making these girls less predictable. Pyra and Mithra are both so incredibly lovable for their own respective reasons. Pyra comes off as super charming right off the bat, and her forbearing nature is perfect for not only Rex considering he's a new driver, but the player as well since they're also new to the game and still getting a grasp of this new world. And while it takes Mithra a bit to open up and let down her guard, the wait is well worth it when you finally meet the respectable, courageous woman that she is. This dynamic is such an efficient way of grasping the player's attention throughout the adventure the way their personalities have been crafted makes it extremely unlikely that the player doesn't like and relate to at least one of them, if not both. Having two people sharing the role results in almost always catering to the player's preference. The main reason I've brought up their individual qualities is so I can show the contrast. Their differences in character really help in keeping the story from getting stale, as they bring forth diverting discussions with other people. You start to realize how each of them specialize in certain situations. For example, it's Pyra who Rex brings to his parents' grave, because she's always cared 
shared more about his past and well-being. She's the one who will always have open ears and support you in your troubles. But then Mithra's the reason that Pyra was able to open up about her past, since she essentially gave her no choice. Call it brutal, but it's effective. Same goes for the heart-to-heart -heart with Morag, called Family Ties. Morag is filled with distraught due to not being able to speak with her brother, as he's always so busy with his duties as Emperor. Both Pyra and Mithra send the same message, but it's ultimately Mithra who convinces her. I also really love the lengths they went to fully realize these characters. Xenoblade 2 does so many little things to fully commit to their identities. For example, while their body proportions are equal, their eyes are actually shaped differently. Pyra's are round and welcoming, whereas Mithra's are sharper, showing her competitive nature. There's even more to unpack within their idol animations. First thing you'll notice is the posture difference. Pyra stands upright, giving a more refined and mature impression, whereas Mithra is more laid back, expressing her high morale and comfort in her own skin. Pyra will also stretch out her arms from time to time, giving a feeling of imperfection, and she'll toss a flame between her hands, displaying her playful, motherly nature. You'll find Mithra just sitting down out of boredom, which also perfectly suits her character. It's such an outstanding example of of showing and not telling. Yet even with all these consistencies, these characters aren't black and white. There are quite a few points throughout the game in which they contradict their usual selves. When Rex is mourning Fan Lenorn's death, Neo points out how Mithra isn't consoling Rex like Pyra normally would. But then Mithra tells us that it was actually Pyra's idea to let him be. Or when we see Mithra crying when Tora reunites with his father, it shows that she has a soft side to her as well. These changes in nature are a large part of what make them three-dimensional characters. And it's all because it's realistic. People aren't robots. They aren't programmed to act the exact same way all the time. Humans are imperfect. They can be pretty unpredictable. And while Pyra and Mithra aren't humans, the people playing the game are. So for the most part, the more human your characters feel, the better. It's really amazing how far their personalities alone go when investing the player in the game. Xenoblade 2 clearly familiarizes the player with each of their identities so seamlessly. The developers and writers took complete advantage of all the small aspects of the game and integrated their personalities into them without telling the player directly. This process is perfect because of how natural it feels. When you meet someone for the first time, they don't immediately start listing adjectives they'd use to describe themselves with. That's weird. You learn what type of person they are by putting the pieces together yourself just like with Pyra and Mithra. Fundamentally, Pyra and Mithra are so charming because of how authentic they feel. While they have distinctive, lovable, consistent personalities which create a unique and overall phenomenal dynamic, they surprise the player with lifelike discrepancies in decisions and actions. And we're just getting started. While a well-written, lovable personality can go a really long way for a character, it's equally, if not more, crucial that they evolve as people, and remain relevant to the narrative throughout the adventure. Giving characters proper arcs is an exceptional method of keeping the player invested in the game, as well as reinforcing that emotional attachment by making them appear as if they were real people. Other than their attractive personalities, Pyra and Mithra's visible growth throughout Xenoblade 2 has to be my favorite part of their characters. But before we even consider the base game, let's start at the very beginning, that being the birth of Mithra and the prequel, Torna the Golden Country. If you haven't played the prequel, it may be in your best interest to skip to the next section of the video. The timestamp will be on screen. It all began when a man by the name of Amalthus climbed the world tree to reach Elysium and meet the architect, hoping to learn his true intention of creating the existing world. But when he arrived, he found nothing except for two core crystals which he brought back with him. These crystals contain the Aegises, Malos, and Mithra. Amalthus awakened Malos himself, and due to his driver's frustration and hatred towards to humanity, it didn't take long for Malos to start ravaging every form of life on the face of all rest. After seeing the damage Malos had done, the search began to find a suitable driver for the second Aegis Core to counter Malos. This leads us to Adam Origo, a prince of the kingdom of Torna. Adam was a good and fair leader, but still a simple, emotional man who would much rather settle down and raise a family than take on his potential role as king. The reason I bring up his personality is because Adam was Mithra's original driver, which means his desires have a rather large impact on who Mithra is. It's demonstrated multiple times how Blades Awakened for the first time tend to have traits that suit or reflect their original driver. The most obvious example is Amalthus and Malos, as Malos is desire to wipe out humanity stems from Amalthus's hatred for the world. It's also safe to assume Zeke was Pandora's first driver considering how in sync they are. And then you have Laura and Hayes as well. They look almost identical and the game doesn't hesitate to point it out. Next to each other like that? You really do look like twins, you two. It's rare for the driver's nature to appear so strongly in their blade. 
As for Adam and Mithra, they're a more interesting case. Like I mentioned before, Adam is the type of guy who'd like to settle down someday, so it's safe to assume he'd like to be a dad eventually. If we take a look at Mithra during the prequel, she starts off a bit selfish, careless, and immature. When asked about her opinion on Malos, she doesn't even bat an eye. She most definitely comes off as a bratty teenage girl, and essentially acts as Adam's practice child. This conversation encapsulates their dynamic perfectly. And Malos himself? His thoughts I'm especially uninterested in. We've never even met. Please, don't mistake her. Despite the attitude, she's a good kid. The hell is with that tone? Where do you get off acting all parental? <laughs> oh, come on. I woke you up. I make sure you get enough to eat. What? But it's not like Mithra remains this impatient adolescent throughout the entirety of Torna. She becomes appreciative of her companions, and recognizes how they're really the closest thing she has to a family, the most significant members being Adam, since he's her driver, and Milton, a younger mighty boy who Adam's been taking care of before he even bonded with Mithra. They're always teasing each other, but deep down, Mithra absolutely cares for him. We know this because of how she reacts when Malus attacks Oresco, the city Milton was staying in during their final clash of the Aegis War. Her smug attitude and confidence is suddenly shattered when she realizes she can't do anything to protect him. She loses control of her own body and becomes consumed by the thought of taking down Malos, no matter the cost. This rage awakens the third Aegis sword, which even Adam can't handle. You see Mithra losing all visible emotion and life that was in her eyes before, further proving that this isn't her, and she's being driven by an impulse that can't be stopped. Yet, even in her thoughtless state, you hear Mithra trying to regain control of herself. Malos is ecstatic that she's giving into the anger and using her immense power for destruction. That's not her intention, but she's already gone too far. As Siren finishes the job, all she can say is... I just... want... to save... Yeah! The vulnerability and sincerity in her words inform the player of how genuine her feelings are. The sentence she can just barely squeak out proves her true, pure intentions. Her perspective of the world has matured so much, and she's changed as a person to now care about the well-being of the people of Allrest. Mithra finally begins to see Malus as a threat, compared to before when she had no interest in his plans whatsoever. She ultimately acknowledges her role as an Aegis, but it's too late. Mithra's attack defeats Malus, but also causes the entire Tornin Titan to sink to the bottom of the Cloud Sea killing all inhabiting it but a small refugee ship. Our remaining party members visit said ship to support the survivors, but seeing Milton's corpse was a bombshell nobody was ready for. Already experiencing extreme trauma and guilt for her actions, Mithra finds Milton's body being held by Mikau. She stumbles forward in disbelief, searching for some kind of sign of life, some way to forgive herself. But all she gets is Mikau pulling him away, afraid she'll do even more damage. Seeing this loss in both life and trust absolutely crushes her, and suddenly Mikau isn't the only one that fears Mithra she does as well. In an effort to save the world from her own power, Mithra impulsively seals herself away and constructs another person to take her place. She subconsciously tries to fix every flaw she sees in herself when creating Pyra. When Mithra was rude, Pyra would be considerate. When Mithra was intolerant, Pyra would be accommodating. When Mithra couldn't control her power, Pyra wouldn't have to worry about it as she wouldn't have the same level of combat capability. Pyra was even made to be a talented chef due to Mithra's lack of skill in the department. This explanation of their differing personalities is ingenious. It's not just a coincidence. Pyra is virtually a result of Mithra's insecurities, and the events beforehand give flawless reasoning for said outcome to happen. This marks the end of the prequel and truly a tragic but significant journey for Mithra. She learned how much she really values the people and the world around her, and becomes a much better and more appealing person. But right as she starts to cherish those who she loves, is the second they're taken away. Even worse, it's by her own hands, so she becomes consumed by the fact that they could have survived if it weren't for her. Her immense care for all the lives lost demonstrates how empathetic and selfish she's become, and the suffering she goes through illustrates to the player how susceptible to hardship and misery she actually is. This is an exceptional way of balancing her high levels of vitality on the battlefield. It can be complicated to write a character with godlike powers, as there's quite the inequality when being compared to the average human being, but seeing her have to face mental issues, which players are more familiar with, gives them a chance to sympathize with her story and avoid a disconnect. It just adds so much authenticity to Mithra's character.
Instead of jumping right back into character development for Xenoblade 2, I want to go over how magnificent the beginning of the game is at subtly portending to both future and past proceedings by using Pyrus character and Mithra's backstory. Saying Xenoblade 2 has a slow start is one of the most common criticisms I hear about this game, but Pyra brings so much mysteriousness, leaving you with so much to dissect if you're actually paying attention. If we resume with the timeline, after Mithra creates Pyra, Adam has her fall into a 500 year long slumber and is sunk in a warship at the bottom of the ocean. The purpose being a test of humanity to see if they're truly worthy of the Aegis's power. Is me sleeping a part of the trial? That's right. It is a trial for us humans, one we must overcome ourselves. If we cannot do that, we don't deserve to live alongside you. Fast forward 500 years and we learn that Malos didn't die in the Aegis War, but his powers have been zapped. In an effort to restore his strength and resume his mission, he hunts down Pyra, who at this time is still sleeping at the bottom of the ocean. To retrieve the sunken warship, Malos and his new team hire a group of salvagers, one of them being a boy named Rex. You can probably see where this is going. Upon the discovery of Pyra, Rex touches the crystal on the sword, bonding him as her new driver. Knowing they can't have Rex bonded with her, Jin quickly thrusts his sword through Rex's heart, killing him where he stands. When he wakes, Rex finds himself in an extensive, gorgeous green field, and in the distance stands Pyra. When Rex first meets her, they have a very similar conversation to Shulk and Alvis from the first game, confirming to the player how major her role in the story will be. My name is Pyra. My name is Alvis. What? Oh right, M mine is... Um, my name's... it's Shulk. I know you. You're Rex, right? How did you know that? How did you know my name? Rex is informed that he in fact is dead, and what he sees is only a memory of Elysium, a supposed promised land that has enough resources to support everyone. Pyra proposes traveling to the potential paradise, which also happens to be her birthplace. So in just the first hour of the game, Pyra's already become the catalyst for the journey to begin, all the while presenting thought-provoking lore for the player to dwell on until something else comes up. Rex is revived by sharing half of Pyra's core crystal, and the game promptly ensures you know how valuable the power he's acquired really is. Whether be the other character's reactions, Pyra saving him multiple times, or her athletic ability, it's made evident how exceptional the Aegis is. From here on out, the writers litter the narrative with so many little hints towards unexpected events or information, and the only reason they're able to do this is because of Pyra. The first example being Malice commenting on Pyra's new form. Takes me back to 500 years ago. What's the deal with that appearance? I'm guessing your goal is Elysium. That is our dream! Then I have no choice but to stop you! Considering almost everyone plays this game before the prequel, they don't know who Malos or Mithra is when being presented with this conversation. So it gets them thinking, wait, Malos knew her 500 years ago? And she has another form? I gotta see where this goes. It gives just enough information to get the player absorbed in the story, but not enough to ruin the upcoming surprise. The writers are using the incredible backstory and character they've already prepared to enhance future events. The next instance of this is the big, big emphasis on the color of Pyrus Core Crystal, that being emerald green. No other blades have this color, except for the Aegis who infamously sank three titans 500 years ago. When Morag calls Pyra out for the destruction of Torna, you see the guilt on her face, but since Pyra's written to be especially innocent, you're not going to associate her with those actions right away. Rex certainly isn't. Instead, you're going to pass it off as some random line coming from a boss trying to provoke you. They've skillfully dropped some seriously critical information alluding towards Mithra by presenting red herrings to throw you off. In this case, it's Pyra's personality. The same brilliant method of foreshadowing happens on the battlefield as well. Being the legendary Aegis, Pyra has a reputation of being the strongest blade in all rest, but she's clearly outmatched by Brigid. Of course, it's actually Mithra who earned this reputation, but before you have the chance to consider the possibility of a second form, you're hit with lines like this. This is getting tiresome. The power of the Aegis is formidable, but the driver's skill betrays her. So, you blame it all on Rex. It's still very clear that Pyra is hiding something. We just don't know what that could be at this point. The game captivates you because of all the unanswered questions first presented through Pyra. Uriah is fairly similar, as the world's desire for the Aegis is only further reinforced via Van Damme and Akos' attacks, continuing to highlight how inexperienced Rex is. But then we get this really meaningful scene after defeating an Elder Arachno. Vandom explains how a blade will return to its core crystal once its driver dies, but completely forget 
read about its past life. Rex's, and most likely the player's initial reaction to this information is, wow, that's really rough. Living an entire life and then having to completely disremember who you once were? That's brutal. But Pyra, being an Aegis who lives forever and retains all her memories, thinks differently. Yeah? That's pretty rough. To have all your past wiped out like that. But memories can be... painful as well. They can be a terrible burden. And a blade can live forever, as long as the crystal exists. It's just as well. Eternity is a long time to collect bad memories. Pyra. I'm sorry. I was just thinking, sometimes being able to forget is a blessing. Hearing this completely different perspective is pretty staggering at first, but the more you think about it, the more it makes sense. And when you hear how much Pyra's past seems to have affected her, you want to see the full picture. Each of Pyra's scenes build off each other, and are perfectly paced to fill the player with curiosity, and then introduce even more mind-blowing information at just the right time. They follow this up with the play at Fontamima, which is literally a reenactment of the Aegis War. So at this point, the players had plenty of foreshadowing and hints to the point where Mithra's reveal will sit in that perfect spot of surprising, but not out of place. So they bring back Malus and Akos, and Mithra is referenced one more time to get you hyped up for the boss fight and tighten that knot for good measure. Just give it up, girl. Think you can do it alone? Handle that power? Ugh. I won't use that power, and I won't let you use it either! Ultimately, Pyra and the gang are no match. There have been plenty of fights in which our party has struggled, but they've always found a way out, whether that be Azurda, the Water Tower, or Van Dam. But when Malas strikes him down, for the first time you feel a sense of hopelessness. And with that, all the conditions have been met to create the perfect situation for Mithra's introduction. The player has just enough insight, and our protagonists are in dire need of saving. So right before Malas has a chance to end Rex, Pyra transforms, and the difference is made so obvious immediately. The transition from the tragic notes of desolation to the upbeat intro of Counterattack impeccably encapsulates the sudden change in tone and power. In a snap of the fingers, suddenly that confidence that previously resided in Malos and Akos has faded. You can hear the sheer panic and worry in their voices, as Mithra attacks them by merely standing still. They end up retreating, but it's no reason to celebrate. Because of Rex's impulsive actions, Van Damme nearly died for nothing, and Mithra had to break her seal. She expresses her frustration shortly after. Why? Huh? Why did you wake me up? Huh? What? I didn't want to wake up. I didn't want to come back. I left everything to her so I'd never have to use that power again. But then you woke me up. W woke you up? If you hadn't been so useless, none of this would have happened. I wouldn't have had to use this power. Didn't you listen to that Van Damme guy? He told you to hold back. He told you to run, but you just had to push yourself, idiot. Look where it's got us now. You! You really messed up. You don't have to tell me that. I know, all right. I knew I was being an idiot. Rex. But I just... I couldn't hand you over to them. I wanted to keep you safe. What? When Rex tells her he just wanted to keep her safe, Mithra is left speechless. If you think about it, she probably didn't get that same affection from Adam. While he's a nice guy, at the end of the day, the only goal was to stop Malos. I know I mentioned earlier how Mithra was like his practice child, but that doesn't mean he gave her the same care that he would to his actual daughter. It was closer to a preparation and a warning as to how teenagers could behave, rather than an actual adoption. Point is, she's been alone all this time, with nobody caring much about her well-being. While she did talk to Pyra a lot during their 500 year slumber, it's still extremely jarring for her to hear this from her driver, so she switches to Pyra to think it over. This is the first time we see this incomparable technique of displaying Pyra and Mithra's relationship with each other. It's pretty challenging to showcase their connection as they share the same body, but the writers still make it work. Before we go any further, I want to go over another really clever design choice now that Mithra has been added back into the mix. You'll notice on both Pyra's chess piece and tassels that she has a green cross on the left and just one stroke on the right, whereas Mithra's has matching crosses in the same areas, but mimicking a flash of light, referencing her element. The main difference here is the symmetry, or lack 
lack of it in Pyra's case. Symmetry symbolizes a kind of balance in truth, which makes sense for Mithra considering she's the original form. Meanwhile, Pyra is created afterwards, and by accident. Her asymmetry exposes her imperfection or flaws on the battlegrounds. This is also drawn into their sword designs, in which Pyrus has a hilt and a blade on one side, but Mithras is equal all around. The first section of Xenoblade 2 is just all about immaculate pretending through Pyra. There are countless clues alluding to forthcoming incidents, so the player always feels in the loop and the narrative avoids becoming cryptic and convoluted, the result being a superb bolt from the blue at the end of chapter 3 with a spectacular balance of setup and shock value by using Pyra's at times enigmatic and ambiguous nature. So now that we have Mithra, what happens now? The exposition of the game is hint after hint after hint, preparing the player for Pyra's true power, and it appears as if now we've reached the climax. So how do the writers maintain the player's interest in the campaign? Well here's where the ingenuity of two characters in one comes in. If Pyra's true power was just an enhanced Pyra, it would be a bit difficult to keep the story captivating afterwards because the player might feel as if they've seen all there is to see. But when her true form is a brand new character, there is so much more to sink your teeth into, especially when you see how much colder Mithra is at first. And that brings me to the biggest complaint I always hear about Mithra. She's a tsundere. For those unfamiliar, a tsundere is a character archetype commonly used in Japanese media, referring to characters that start off unpleasant and temperamental, but over time gradually show a warmer side. Many find this trope to be overused and tiring. But let me ask you this. How many tsundere's voluntarily seal themselves away from the world because they're terrified of their own power after unintentionally killing thousands of innocent lives, and then have to break that seal just because a kid wouldn't listen and turn back? It's not like Mithra is just grumpy for no reason. She's depressed, and has so many levels of depth in the form of tragic backstory that clarify why she possesses such a sour first impression. Mithra doesn't trust herself in the slightest and wanted to eliminate any chance of doing more damage, but now she's left to live in fear. It would not make sense for her to act any other way. So at this point, the writers have gotten the player to develop a fondness and level of care for Pyra, and the same will be done with Mithra. While she's a bit irritable to begin with, the game makes sure to throw in innumerable situations in which she's forced to remember her past. This ranges from meeting Haze again, to questioning Amalthus, and finding out Jin is now a flesh eater. So when the player learns all that she has bottled up inside, they can't help but forgive her for the initial bitter attitude, and start to appreciate and understand Mithra as a whole. Additionally, her every appearance in fights almost always increases her overall appeal. When you finally see Mithra working together with Rex and Pyra in these high definition fight scenes, the coolness factor alone goes a really long way in getting the player to treasure and value this new dynamic. Rex, after this foresight, I'll switch to Pyra. Understood. Impossible! He dodged it! Now it's my turn! Lady Moira, look at the Aegis, so you can change at will. Eat this! The quality of scenes continue to improve content-wise as well. We're shown another really enthralling contrast between Pyra and Mithra, that being how their memories affect them. Although Mithra is the one who experienced the events firsthand, present day she seems to have gotten past a lot of what happens. A great example is when Jin calls her out for sinking the Torn and Titan 500 years ago, yet she remains unfazed despite being reminded of a past blunder. But whenever the writers do want to emphasize the consequences of Mithra's actions, they use Pyra instead. When Bridget is speaking of her journal she uses to retain her memories of past past lives, it's Pyra in her presence. Then you're reminded of the scene after the Elder Arachno fight back in Chapter 3, and how she doesn't want to remember. Now that you've spent plenty of time with her, the game is getting you to become more and more sympathetic at the appropriate time, thus increasing how much you value Pyra in the story and as a character. And now that you've formed a certain devotion to these characters, especially Pyra, that adoration is taken advantage of to keep you engrossed. The first exemplification of this is in Tantal when we first arrive at Theoswar. As soon as the king sees Pyra, he captures her without hesitation, and due to the lack of ether flow, there is nothing our party can do to fight back. Having frequent losses like these gives the player greater desire for improvement and recovery, and of course, rescuing Pyra because of that soft spot they now have for her. If we fast forward towards the end of chapter 6, we have a similar situation except it's turned up to 11. Just as we retrieve the Omega Fetter, Torna shows up to stop us. Akos, Petroka, and Mikal go down pretty easily, but Jin is the real issue. The sheer velocity and power of his movements make him absolutely insurmountable. 
Even with Mithra's foresight, seeing into the future doesn't help them avoid their inevitable doom, as they simply can't catch up. Even a strike from Mithra's artifice leaves them unaffected. Seeing one of their strongest possible attacks just absorbed like nothing leaves Mithra, Rex, and the player feeling truly demoralized. With nothing to stop him, Jin strikes down the defenseless Rex and Mithra, leaving them severely injured. And despite our party members' efforts, they find themselves under the clutches of several artificial blades. Rex makes an attempt to keep fighting, but Jin's foot to his skull is all it takes to bring his efforts to a screeching halt. Seeing how much pain he's in, Pyra speaks up. Put the sword away, Jin. If not, I'll... You'll do what, exactly? I will... Annihilate myself. Hearing these words isn't pleasant for anyone there. Not Rex, not Jin, and especially not the player. Malos, being the arrogant Aegis he is, doesn't believe her, but is sorely mistaken. But how would you make good on that threat? You don't have that kind of- Are you so sure about that? This is a shock. The combination of Pyra's confidence and comfort in the situation as she draws the red beam from the artifice is more than terrifying. Knowing that at any moment she so chooses, she can be completely erased from the world, there is no way you're not sitting on the edge of your seat. One signal from me, and my body will be scoured from this world faster than you can blink. So? Jin? How unexpected. That you, an Aegis, would say something like that. So you'll do it. Open the gates to Elysium for us. Yes. If that is your wish. Don't, Hyra! They'll just... Uh! Jin? Seeing Rex's struggle and Pyra amplifying the power gets your heart doing backflips out of your chest. When the game presents a situation in which almost every outcome results in you losing one of, if not your most beloved character, it brings all the emotions out of you. Knowing they can't have Pyra killed, Jin steps back, and for the first time you see this defeated look on his face. But the truth is, they've won. Our party has most definitely lost the fight and more importantly, our most valuable member. To rub some salt in the wounds, the writers use Pyra's bond with the other characters to make it all the more crushing through their reactions. Pyra, Mia, keep Rex safe for me. No, no way, I don't agree to this. At this point, almost every player is in the same headspace. There is no time for side quests, affinity charts, farming core crystals, or any other game for that matter. Getting Pyra and Mithra back becomes your number one priority because you care. You're not just going to the next objective because that's what the game is telling you to do. You're doing it because you actually want to. So you take that indignation Jin invoked in you and use it until you fill that Pyra shaped hole in your heart. After a nearly fruitless expedition to the Spirit Crystal Elpis, Rex uses his half of Pyra and Mithra's core crystal to track them down to the Cliffs of Moritha. It's right here where the writers really start twisting your heart by taking advantage of your love for Pyra and Mithra that they've been building up the whole game with some of the most brutal and heart-wrenching cutscenes. Your first introduction to the place is seeing Malos suck the life force out of Pyra to regain his Aegis powers. The combination of the purple ether lines and the blank lifeless look on her face is more than excruciating to watch. The fact that it's Pyra in said position is what makes it so much more intolerable, and that's just the visual side of things. I know I couldn't make this video without giving a massive shout out to Pyra and Mithra's English voice actress, Sky Bennett. Especially in this scene, her performance feels so authentic that I get chills every time. The sheer terror and sincerity in her voice only increases your sense of urgency to the point where it's overwhelming. When Rex finally reaches Pyra, Jin, and Malos, it only gets worse. Hearing Malos mock Pyra's final words and throw her to the ground like garbage, it's violently disheartening. She tried so pathetically hard to hold on to her memories of you. But in the end, I got them all. Uh, she put up a brave little fight. Please don't steal my memories. Cute stuff like that. Sorry, boy. You came to this desolate place for nothing. Do you really want this useless husk? Go ahead and take it! 
Determined as always, Rex stands his ground and you're presented with the toughest fight in the game by far. Something I love about video games is how they can tell their stories through gameplay. This is the biggest obstacle for our heroes yet, and you understand that uphill battle because you're actively participating. Video games are able to achieve a whole nother level of viewer involvement that other forms of storytelling will never accomplish. The reason I bring this up is because of what happens next. While you were just fighting the absolute best you could, eyes darting around the screen looking for blade combos and arts available, all the while desperately trying to get your heels off to keep your party alive, you see that adversity translated into the form of a cutscene. Having just spent ages to only take away a fraction of their health bars, the addition of Rex and the party's visible pain and hardship really gives the impression that there is no hope left. And even in your darkest hour, just when you thought things couldn't get worse, you hear a familiar voice in the background, saying, Enough! Give up, Rex! Forget about us! At first, you almost feel betrayed. You've been fighting through each arduous task to get Pyra back, and now it seems as if she doesn't care for your efforts. But everything changes with the next lines. Rex, please listen to what we have to say. Our power has done nothing but bring you pain. It would be better if such a power didn't exist. We told you we wanted to go to Elysium, but... The reason why we wanted to go there was to beg our father to let us die. So forget us, Rex. For the sake of the world, abandon us. When you hear these words, there is nothing to stop the tears from falling. All of the pieces of the puzzle start falling together. You remember Pyra talking to Corinne and Fonset and saying, maybe Rex is better off without me after hearing how tough he's had it and realizing the burden she will be and has been to him, or Pyra's disturbing willingness to sacrifice herself at the end of chapter 6. These moments got you to empathize with Pyra, and they hurt because of the admiration you've built for her. Realizing that she had no will to live in the first place is infinitely more agonizing because it was right in front of you the entire time, and you did nothing about it. Even though you couldn't have done anything, that guilt still lingers because of your attachment to her, and fathoming that Mithra feels the same way just doubles the grief. But that's where Rex comes in. He's the shining light in an infinite sea of darkness, and flawlessly puts the player's thoughts into words. Abandon you. When you are injured, I feel your pain. When you feel pain, I feel the sorrow in your heart. <laughs> what the hell? Has he finally cracked? You really think I can just stand by like this? And watch someone I love suffer? You can make it to Elysium. You can make it. With or without us. So please... What would be the point of that? Listen, I swore to you. We're going to Elysium together. That's a promise. Rex. I'm going to Elysium for you. I'm doing all of this for you. We'll do it together. We'll find out together. We'll find your place in this world. Find out where we're headed and see what our future holds. So believe me, I won't let the world burn a second time. So, Pyra, Mithra, Join me! This is by far my favorite cutscene in the entire game. You start off heartbroken after hearing Pyre and Mithra's pleas to move on without them, and learning of their suicidal intentions is petrifying. But then Rex gives them the strength to move forward. He lets them know how much they're loved and cherished by both in-game characters and those playing the game. It is so beautiful how all of this unfolds. Pyre and Mithra first embarked on this quest for Elysium to erase themselves from the world, but now they found reasons to love the world, the people around them, and more importantly, themselves. They've gone from being lost, unwilling to keep going, and feeling as if they were nothing but an inconvenience to Rex, to hopeful, optimistic, perseverant, and ultimately happy because they found the motive to live. This character development is so gratifying because of how much you've resonated with them in the past. It's hard not to be completely consumed by joy. As a result of their newfound faith, Pyra and Mithra unlock their final form, that being Numa. 
Numa is as Mithra describes it, both of them at once, which is a good thing. If Numa was a completely different character with her own personality and thoughts, it would feel so unnatural coming out of such a pivotal moment for both Pyra and Mithra. Thankfully, she acts more as a reward and a symbol of growth. This is actually displayed through a really clever artistic decision. While the revealing clothing may seem insignificant and meaningless to the unseeing eye, it actually gives off a feeling of vulnerability and incompleteness. If we take a look at Numa, she's almost completely covered, reflecting her unrivaled strength and role as the Aegis' ultimate and complete form. Her color scheme is also done perfectly, as it mimics the green of the core crystal both Pyra and Mithra share, so it feels like the perfect middle ground. If we move on to chapter 8, we start seeing so many to terrific moments exhibiting how Pyra and Mithra have matured. If their character arc happened too late, we wouldn't have any time to appreciate how they've developed. Fortunately, that isn't the case. We have three whole chapters to fall in love with them even more than we have already. Take Mithra's conversation with Rex in the land of Moritha, for example. Mithra discloses that she's chosen to no longer live in fear. If we compare this to when she left everything to Pyra, never planning to return, the development is clear as day. Mithra's learned that she needs to trust herself. Of course she's aware of how difficult that task will be, but she knows she can't be afraid to fail as it's the only way she'll improve. On top of that, you have her promise with Poppy. After seeing how technological advancements left Moritha in total ruin, it scares Poppy that she might do the same. The fear of destroying the world is a feeling Mithra knows all too well, and now she acts as a role model and mentor to give Poppy reassurance. Even the way she interacts with her makes Mithra come across as a much more dependable person. Pyra gets some time in the spotlight as well. During our climb up to Elysium, Nia stops us to ask a question to all the Blades present. Tell the truth. Have you ever wanted to extend your life? Everyone gives about the same answer, as living with their driver is really the only thing that matters to them. But it's not like Pyra has a choice. When Rex passes away, she'll still be around. Pyra, what do you think about her? Really? Hey! Sometimes, I wonder why I have to keep on living forever. Just on and on, no end in sight. But... It's different now. I'm glad I've stayed alive all this time. Parting is always sad. But it's just part of the deal of being me. Though... Maybe... Maybe one day I'd be happy to close my eyes forever. With someone special. There. By my side. I am willing to bet that if this was the Pyra from the beginning of the game, she wouldn't even be able to answer the question. Back in Chapter 2, when merely being asked about where her power comes from, she had no words. But since then, she's accepted her identity, and the rules that come with being her. It's still really tough for her to think about, but now Pyra's willing to make the most of her life instead of dwelling on the past. There's another great instance of this when we're speaking with the Architect. Klaus apologizes for having burdened her for so long, but she forgives him. Numa. No, I should call you Pyra and Mithra. What is it? I want to apologize for having burdened you with all this. Don't worry. We're actually grateful. Thanks to you, Father, we got to meet Rex and everyone else. Those are cherished memories. This is completely different from the Pyra we knew during the exposition of the journey, in which she wanted nothing but to forget. These words are almost like a sequel to her previous speech, fleshing it out just a bit more for good measure. It's so fulfilling to view distinct, specific examples in which you can clearly see the alterations in Pyra and Mithra's characters compared to the beginning of the game. These scenes make their arcs feel so much more meaningful, and you really get a proper grasp on how they've changed for the better. With all that out of the way, it's time for the final act. After a ruthless battle with Artifice Ion, we finally take down Malos thanks to the power of Numa. But just as we split Ion in two, both Klaus and the Conduit disappear, destabilizing Elysium and putting all rest in grave danger as the Beanstalk begins to fall. However, Numa tells us there is one way to prevent it, that being going into the control room and accelerating the boosters beyond escape velocity. Without thinking twice, our party rushes down those five stories as quickly as possible, but Numa stays back. Upon reaching the supposed control room, we find that it's actually a port full of escape vessels. Instantly putting the pieces together, Rex runs back to see Numa standing on the other side of the bridge. This was the first lie I ever told you. Pyra! The only way to stop the World Tree's collapse is to use the last of Ion's power. 
and annihilate the world tree. I'm sorry. It is the only way. You all need to use one of those escape vessels and get as far away as possible. What? The last of Aeons? Pyra! What are you doing? It'll... it'll be fine, right? You'll deal with the world tree, then come back, right? Rex tries every way he can to get over to Numa, but that's just not a possibility. At this point, we've gone through some of the most tear-jerking scenes with Pyra and Mithra, and most of the time, it stems from the idea of losing them. Now that we're at the climax, the player's more attached to them than ever as they've been through all their endeavors and progression. And although Pyra sacrificed herself for the sake of her friends before, it hits so much harder this time because now she values her life. Having to make this decision hurts her tremendously more because of how much she now loves the world and her existence. In her final scene, Numa trans transfers the entirety of her core to Rex, letting him live on while giving her just enough life to destroy the world tree before passing away. As our protagonists run to the escape vessels, you hear Numa's last lines along with the song, The Tomorrow With You, creating such a sentimental moment. Rex, I'm so glad to have met you. Our time together was short, a fraction of my long, long years. It's been warmer and brighter than any time I can remember before. You shone a light on my melancholy path. You showed me the way. As our party departs from the World Tree, their escape pod breaks, but thankfully we're saved by Azurda. As we soar across all rest, at first glance it seems as if everything and everyone is gone. But we ultimately find the Titans merging with a massive lance, creating the true Elysium they were searching for. From there, we cut to credits, and it leaves the player in a really tough spot. While we did find Elysium, we lost our favorite characters in the process. It's so bittersweet, and you really don't know how to feel in this situation. But as you're watching the credits, a song starts to play along with a memory of Pyra. The game starts showing you all the most important moments you've spent with Pyra and Mithra throughout your journey, and it leaves you a mess. Reminiscing about all the great times you've shared with them, while knowing they're gone, is devastating, and the song titled One Last You just builds upon those feelings. I adore the gorgeous strings and melodies within this composition, but the lyrics are really what make it so effective in this moment. It's undoubtedly written from Pyron Mithra's perspective, giving the player one more chance to hear their thoughts. The majority of the words are most likely about Rex. The verses tell us how they've accepted their fate, but will never forget how magical their time with him was, with lines like, I will trace back all my memories with you. That's the only wish I have. The chorus has a similar message, except it's a bit more specific as the words hone in on their final day alive. And when it's paired with Numa's last breath, one of the sweetest moments with Pyra, and then transitioning to the present, it all meshes together so beautifully. In this scene, the camera shows each of our main characters, along with their primary blade, by their side. Zeke with Pandoria, Morag with Brigid, Tora with Poppy, and Nia with Dromark. But then it switches over to Rex, who's all alone. The intentional order of these shots reinforces Pyron Mithra's absence, giving just a little extra sting. By now, we start transitioning to the bridge of the song, which is just filled with gratitude. It's essentially Pyron Mithra saying thank you, and wishing they could give something back in return. As these words are sung, you and Rex notice the flashing light coming from their core crystal, perfectly lining up with the lyrics.
I love this ending so much. Throughout the entire game, Pyra and Mithra are being taken away from you time and time again, each instance worse than the last. The final cutscene truly feels like the perfect climax when looking back, and seeing them return at the end overwhelms you with pure happiness. Having a story conclude on a happy note lets the players walk away with a good taste in their mouth, remembering their experience with Xenoblade Chronicles 2 in a positive light. At the end of the day, most of, if not all the happiness, heartbreak, tragedy, triumph, and love you felt within this adventure are thanks to Pyron Mithra. Seeing Pyra and Mithra again to Smash Ultimate was probably the most happy I've ever been during a video game presentation, and considering you made it to the end of this video, you probably felt the same way. But unfortunately, with every Smash reveal comes the ungrateful, toxic community. It was really frustrating seeing all these baseless claims about Pyra and Mithra coming from people who had no evidence to back it up. Me and so many other Xenoblade fans have been defending them for ages, trying to get people to open their minds. I've always had so much to say, so I decided to make this video to organize my thoughts. I'm so sick of fans getting shamed for liking these characters, because the truth is, they love them for the same reasons I do. Out of all the Pyra and Mithra fans who've actually completed Xenoblade 2, there are very few people who only like them on the visual side. We love them for their painful but motivating backstory, the exceptional foreshadowing they bring to the narrative, how relatable they are due to their personalities and growth, and how memorable they make this game. After you beat Xenoblade 2, it's so easy to see how massively Pyra and Mithra have benefited the main story in retrospect. When you think back to all the best moments of the narrative, most of them stem from Pyra and Mithra's presence. Xenoblade Xenoblade Chronicles 2 would not be the same game without them, and if you're somehow watching this and haven't played the game, please do. The storytelling is just so much more effective when you're the one holding the controller. Listening to a summary or watching the scenes off YouTube just isn't the same. Before I go, I want to give a massive thank you for making it to the end. I know this video is really long and I probably repeated myself a bit, but I'm so grateful that people care enough to sit through me talking for this long. I've been working on this project since May, and I'm so thrilled to finally get it out. Pyra and Mithra are just so amazing, and I really wanted to to give them a video they deserved. I poured my heart and soul into the scripts and I really hope my passion bled through. I'm always looking to improve the quality of these videos, so I would really appreciate any constructive criticism so I can do better next time round. Once again, thank you so, so, so much. I hope you have a fantastic day.